I want to teach you today on something, and I want you to everybody repeat after me and say, What makes religion, what makes religion? So, powerful? so powerful? Today's subject is, What makes religion so powerful? Brothers and sisters, I've been given a lot of thought to why our people are so committed. Why our people are so bound to a religion that's not authentic, it's not historical, is not valid, is not true, is not real, and it definitely isn't spiritual. But yet, our brothers and sisters are committed and bound to this religion in a way that's hard to understand. Now, I do understand why our people are so emotionally attached to the religions that they practice. I understand that. But what baffles me is why is it that after seeing that their belief system is flawed, after seeing that there are inconsistencies in their own spiritual books. It doesn't line up with fact and reality. Why is it that after seeing this, they still make a conscious decision to remain obligated to what their own intuition reveals to them to be a lie? That's deep. I was in Texas a little over a month ago and I visited a church there while I was there. And I sat in on this midweek study. And it was deep, y'all, because that's really the first time I had been in a church in a long time. And as I listened to the pastor teaching, I realized two things. The first thing I realized is why this Christian religion has such a stronghold on our people. And the second thing that I realized is why those who had been delivered from this religion seemingly did not have a life of service and sacrifice and commitment as they once did. Now, I don't know if you heard that second one. I'll say it again. The second thing I realized is that many of our people who have been delivered from religion. How many of y'all have been delivered from religion? Let me see hand. All the hands up. Almost all the hands up. Okay. The second thing I noticed is that many of our people who have been delivered from religion seemingly, seemingly do not have a life of service and sacrifice and commitment that they had when they was in religion. Those are the two things that stood out to me that night as I listened to this brother. And that's what I want to talk about today. What makes religion so powerful? Religions all of them, Christianity, Islam, and I should, I should say the many forms of Christianity, whether it's Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, you know, all those different forms and denominations. Same thing with Islam, the many forms of Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them. All of these religions, hear this well, all of these religions offer something that being set free from religion does not offer. Are y'all hearing me? All of these religions, and Minister Sharon and I talked about this some years ago. All of these religions have a marketing strategy. that makes them almost irresistible and develops an obligatory response from the believers of these religions. When I say a marketing strategy, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? What does the believer gain from being a part of this religion? 
This is the marketing strategy. When I say a marketing strategy, what will they get in return for doing their religious work as dictated in their religious book? Whether it's the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, the Vedas, the Tripitaka, whatever. What, what, after they carry out what these religious books say, they are looking forward to getting what the book says they're going to get. After they die, they have something to look forward to. So they think. You see, the answer is real simple. Not only is the believer a bona fide member of this organization, of this body called the church. But when they die, they will receive rewards. Everybody say rewards. rewards. They will receive rewards for their earthly service and sacrifice. And the good thing about a man is these rewards will last, thank you, throughout eternity. That's deep, man. You see, brothers and sisters, in the religion, especially of Christianity, where salvation as is a gift, it's a free gift, there are rewards that's given for faithfulness, for enduring temptation, for productivity. There are rewards you get in Christianity, in Islam, in Buddhism. They're rewards, man. You know, it's really deep. And what really drives people to perform, what, what drives people to do is they fear losing their reward. So the entire idea of the loss of, it, of their reward when they get to heaven is a motivator. It is the basis of the motive for everything they do. Will there be any stars in my crown? I'm going to get a crown. Soon as my feet strike Zion, I'm lay down my heavy burden. Put on my what? Robe. Oh, Lord have mercy. Then I'm, talk I'm talking about poor folk who ain't hardly got no clothes. They see a robe coming. And a golden crown broke as they are right now. So this is what obligates people to this religion. Minister Stewart, you got your Bible. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm getting ready to do a lot of Bible reading. Let me be clear. So that you understand this. Those of you who are watching me. Those of you who are listening to this DVD. Let me be clear. I am not teaching what we are about to read as truth. I'm showing you the hook that's in your viscera that you can't get free from. Does everybody understand what I'm just saying? Revelation 22 and 12. Let's find out what the Bible says here. Now these are, how many of y'all were raised from a Christian perspective? Let me see any. All right, so if you went to church at all growing up, these are the kind of messages that you heard. These are the kind of messages you heard. Ready, what do you got? And behold, I come quickly. Now check this out. And my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Y'all get this? This is the teaching of Christianity. This is the teaching that Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and when I come back, now in order for y'all to grab that, you need to get my DVD, there will be no rapture. And Jesus is not coming back. Y'all need to get that, because I'm not going to go into that right now, because that will let you know that this ain't even about to happen. Okay? But for those who don't know that, Notice what it says. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to do what with? To give every man according as his work shall be. To give to every person according to the works 
they have done. A massive motivator to inspire sacrifice and service on the part of the believer. Because when he comes back, I want my reward. African consciousness does not offer that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians now. Third chapter, verses 11 through 15. Now it's really deep because when Minister Stewart is getting ready to read, I remember back in the mid 70s when I was in school in Bible college, I preached this in my mother's church, but I preached it from the perspective of really believing it to be true. And even though I preached it, my mom sat me down because I mentioned about rewards, not losing your salvation. And of course, in the Pentecostal church, they don't teach you can not lose your salvation. They teach you can lose your salvation. And when I taught this, she stood up and she said, Elder Higgins, give me the microphone. Have a seat. And I said, well, I said why? She said, because I don't teach that in Check out what's, what she's about to read. Good. Notice this. Now, again, this is, I'm not teaching this as truth. I'm trying to show you the basis of why our people are so bound to this religion. And I hope that you take what you're hearing today and help free somebody else with it. Go ahead, read. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. Which you, is you can't lay no other foundation than the one that's laid. And who is that foundation? Jesus Christ. According to Christianity, it's Jesus Christ. Now check out this part because it gets real deep here. Go ahead, what does it say? Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones. Everybody say gold, silver, precious stones. Gold, silver, precious stones. Look at somebody and say those things cannot be burned. Those things cannot be burned. What else does it say? Wood, hay, stubble. Everybody say wood, hay, stubble. Wood, hay, stubble. Say these things can be burned. These things can be burned. Okay, go ahead. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Now this is what Christians are taught. Christians are taught that when Jesus comes back, he's going to judge everybody. And he's going to judge you by the works that you've done. And if the works that you've done equate to gold, silver, and precious stones, because the test is going to be by fire, your works will last. But if your works equate to wood, hay, stubble, meaning you've done selfish things, stuff that don't matter, you wasted your time, you didn't do good works and all that kind of stuff, your works will be burned up. Because wood, hay, and stubble burns by fire. Do y'all grab this? Wow. This is what Christians are taught. Go ahead, what does it say? And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. In other words, whether it's gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Go ahead. If any man's work abide which he had built thereupon, yes. he shall receive a reward. Everybody say reward. Reward. Are y'all getting this? Yes. In other words, Christians honestly think that they going to get a reward. <laughs> this is what makes this religion so powerful. And those who wasted their time, spent on selfish issues, stuff that don't really matter, like you ain't pay your tithes. You wasn't here every time the church door opened. When you were asked to do something for the church, you didn't do it. All that kind of stuff, all that kind of psychology, which is wood, hay, stubble, what happened? If any man's work shall be burned, yes. he shall suffer loss. He shall suffer loss. Loss of his what? Reward. Oh, come on, y'all. Loss of his what? Reward. Reward. Go ahead. But he himself shall be saved. Oh, check this out now. But he's going to be saved. He's going to be saved, but he ain't going to have no reward. Now, it ends with a very important analogy. What does it say? Yet, yet so, so as, as by, by fire. fire. In other words, 
in the Greek here, and I'm saying Greek because the New Testament was written in Greek, this, the, the analogy or the story is a man who wakes up in the middle of the night and his house is on fire. And he's sleeping with nothing on and he manages to escape out of his house and gets outside and turns around and looks back and see everything that he ever worked for going up in flames. That's what it means, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire, meaning everything that he, everything is gone. Look at somebody near you and say, black folk don't want that. You don't want to spend your life in church. You don't want to spend your life in service. In service to the Lord. And after he comes back, you ain't got no reward. Remember, brothers and sisters, in the Christian belief system, salvation is a gift. You receive eternal life as a gift when you take their fictitious, their what? With, oh, I forgot, I forgot y'all, I forgot. Everybody do this. I usually do this at the beginning of the message, I forgot. Everybody repeat after me. The space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. All that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented right here inside this circle. I must keep in mind that there is more to know than what is within the circumference of my awareness. Y'all got that? Because see, I, I just said something that I know is slapping somebody, especially those of you who are watching this right now. I know you just kind of like just, but I'm going to say it again. Eternal life is a gift that you receive when you take their fictitious Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, in order for you to understand why I said fictitious, you need to get my lecture, Nicaea 325 AD, the council that created Jesus, because that would take too long to go into that too. So you got to put all this together here. That's right. That's right. Nicaea 325, the Nicene Council, is where they created Jesus Christ. 318 Roman Catholic bishops voted to make Jesus, make Serapis Jesus Christ. Don't take my word for it. Those of you watching right now, just Google Serapis, S-E-R-A-P-I-S. -E Google it. The name is at the bottom of your screen right now. Look at it and free your African mind. Now, let's talk about these rewards. In religion, rewards are earned. How many of y'all have ever received a reward for doing something good? Let me see your hand. Like, you know, how many, and you know, like when you were growing up, your, your, your parent might have said to you, you know, like, if you get good grades in school, uh, I'll get you a bicycle, or, you know, or of course, when you graduate from high school, I'll buy you a car, or da 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 da. See, that was the motive. Y'all getting this? That was the motive for sacrifice. That was the motive for doing what you're supposed to do. Personally, I never agreed with giving out a reward for doing what you're supposed to do. Did you ever receive a reward for doing something good? Doing good on your report card, or maybe your boss gave you a reward on your job. A bonus for doing a great job. Or maybe they took you out to dinner for a job well done. Well, according to Christian thought, according to Islamic thought, according to Buddhist thought, believe it or not, God gives rewards to his children for the good things that they do. God does not give rewards, according to their teaching, to unsaved people. Oh, shucks. Y'all see why we have a problem now? Because if you ain't saved, if you don't believe in this religion, you ain't getting no reward. And black folk want a reward. We ain't got nothing else. 
What rewards ain't that important to wait for? The bankers, business owners, they have their reward. But because we're struggling so hard now in this planet, man, we say, you know, when I get over in glory, don't tell me I ain't gonna get nothing. That's what I'm doing all this for. Y'all get this? Well, now you're telling them, you know, Jesus don't exist and you want them to accept African consciousness and, and despite the fact that we're providing historical evidence and archaeological evidence so they can see for themselves the truth. I hear, I hear what you're saying, Doc. I, man, I understand everything you're saying, but, but, what, what going to happen after I die? You see, I ain't got no clothes. So after I die, I'm gonna get some white robe. Not polka dot, not plaid, not blue, brown, earth tones. It's got to be white. Long white robe. You see, the Bible speaks of rewards. Let's look at some of these rewards and I'm gonna break them down to you and show you why our brothers and sisters are so obligated to this program. Minister Stewart, if you would turn to 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verse 19 and 20 for me, please. Everybody say a crown. A crown. Y'all know it. Y'all know the psychology of wearing a crown? Have y'all ever seen the, the pageants? You know, the beauty pageant and stuff? What is what 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 does the winner get? A crown. They place that crown of, and she thinks it's diamonds. They place that crown on her head, and it's like all of the sacrifice, all of the the dieting that I that I went through, we, we, you know, holding back from this, getting plenty of rest. Practicing how to walk, practicing my speech, practicing how to smile when I know I don't want to. All that that I've gotten myself prepared for is finally paid off because I have a reward. This crown on my head, which means that I am the queen. I am the winner. I am the receiver of the highest award that you can get for this. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 19 and 20, what does it say? For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Hold on a minute, hold on, hold on. Now who wrote this? Who wrote this? Now, in order to understand this, these, what I'm saying now, I need y'all to give my lecture the false teachings of the Apostle Paul. That's another lecture of itself. Right now, I'm trying to help you understand why religion is so, what's so powerful about religion. But Paul wrote this when we wrote it. Well, actually, he didn't write it either because Paul never existed. But notice what it says. The soul this has been attributed to Paul. And it says, well, what is our hope? What is our joy or crown of rejoicing? Everybody say crown of rejoicing. Has anybody here ever heard of that before? Crown of rejoicing. No? Let me see your hand if you've heard of that before. Wow, I see why y'all don't understand what's happening. <clears throat> Let me tell you what's taught in Christendom, and all y'all raise your hands say y'all raised in church. Y'all didn't hear about this? It's right there in the Bible. The crown of rejoicing is, go ahead, Minister, uh, Minister Stewart, finish reading it. Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ okay. and his coming? Yes. In other words, aren't y'all now in the body of Christ? Aren't you now saved? Aren't you now going to heaven when the Lord comes back? How do you think y'all are going? Y'all are going because I preached to you and I got you there. So what is he going to say? For you are our glory. You are our glory. Rejoice. You are our crown of rejoicing. So actually, brothers and sisters, this reward is called the soul winner's crown. In other words, you are taught in Christianity, go out in 
to the highways and hedges yes, yes, and compel them yes. to come. Are y'all getting this? What is the psychology here? Because if you win souls to Christ, really what they're saying is, if you get people in your church, when Jesus comes back, you are going to get a crown for winning souls. African consciousness does not offer that. So consequently, since you've been set free, guess what? You ain't worried about getting the crown. So you ain't worried about winning no souls. <laughs> so because, you know, ain't gonna be no crown for the sacrifice of getting out there and beating the pavement, why you think you, why you think the Jehovah's Witnesses go from door to door? Every Saturday morning, man, they out there. They ain't like they wanna be out there. They're trying to get that crown. Why you think people be on the bus passing out tracks? Do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? And you don't even know the Lord. That's for do you know the Lord? You're trying to get that crown of rejoicing for winning people to Christ. Are y'all getting this? Let's look at another crown, 2 Timothy 4. This is some deep stuff, man. And you got people out there, you know, like, I mean, you got people out there beating the pavement. Like they're gonna really get something in return. But they don't know that. They're taught that if you win souls for Christ, that's what they're taught. If you win souls for Christ, you got a crown coming. They would even have rallies in church. All right, all the people that, 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 that are here because Sister Washington witnessed to y'all and won y'all to Christ, stand up. <laughs> Sister Washington's disciples would stand. The whole church, yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, she she, y'all know she got a crown coming. Are y'all seeing how this works? So then other folks say, I want a crown too. So you go out and you guess you should start having pew rallies. To not only get your crown, but also get money. Because everybody, the more folks you get to fill up your pew, that's more money you bring in. You know what I'm saying? It's all about rewards, man. What's this next passage? Second Timothy 4, 6 and 8. What does it say? For I am now ready to be offered. Oh, I'm sure y'all heard this one before, especially at funerals. Go ahead. And the time of my departure. The time of my departure is at hand. In other words, y'all, it's time for me to go now. Go ahead. What is it? I have fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I finished. Yeah, yeah. Finished my course. I have kept the faith. And I. Mm. Held on. Didn't give up. Ah, I kept the faith. Y'all heard this before. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, why do you think people bother to even say that? Why do you think they even bother to let you know that they did all that? Read. It tells you right now. Henceforth. Henceforth. There is laid up for me. A, there is laid up for me. A crown of righteousness. A crown of righteousness. Which the Lord. Yes. The righteous judge. Which the Lord is going to give me when? At that day. At what day? His coming. Go ahead. Read. And, and not to me only. Not to me only. But unto all them. But to all those. Also that love his appearing. Everybody say to all those who love his appearing. Now I got to show y'all the psychology here. Let me show you what Christians are taught here. 
Christians are taught, child, you don't know what day he coming back. So it behooves you. I don't know where they, where they get that word from, behoove. So it behooves you to be ready. Because when he crossed the sky, some of y'all going to be ashamed. Some of y'all going to be caught doing something you ain't got no business doing. When he crossed the sky, you ain't going to love his appearing because you're going to be talking on the phone about somebody. Are y'all getting this? Y'all see the psychology? So the whole thing here is, I got to be sure that since I don't know when he's coming back, I have to spend every moment of my time doing something that I won't be embarrassed about when he comes. I need to love his appearing because if I am not ready, if I don't love his appearing when he comes, I am not going to get the reward called the crown of righteousness. And God knows I want that crown. I want to be declared righteous. Death at a bowl shot there. Y'all get this? So what does that mean? That means that in religion, you intentionally discipline yourself as much as possible, 24 hours a day, to live a life that is holy. So that when he cracks the sky, you can say, yes, Lord, I've been waiting for you. African consciousness doesn't tell you that. So since you don't have to worry about being caught with your pants down, so to say, which is where the word embarrassed comes from, in case y'all didn't know that, embarrassed means embarrassed. That's what it means. That's where the word embarrassed means. It comes from embarrassed. So since you don't be caught embarrassed, You don't spend time on the phone talking about your pastor. Because you don't want him to come back and catch you doing that. You don't look at other women or other men in the church that ain't, you ain't got no business looking at because you don't want the Lord to come back and see you. Y'all getting what I'm saying? See, consciousness does not give you that reward of righteousness. So since you don't have to concern yourself about the crown of righteousness, y'all grabbing this? Let's look at another crown. 1 Peter 5, verse 1 through 4. This is called the preacher's crown or the teacher's crown. What does it say? 1 Peter 5, verse 1 through 4. Yep. Five. Mm -hmm. The elders which are among you, I exhort. Who? The elders. The elders mm -hmm. which are among you, I exhort. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Who am also an elder. I am also an elder. Go ahead. And a witness of the sufferings of and Christ. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Go ahead. And also a partaker of the glory that shall and be And a partaker of the glory that shall be real. Now notice the, notice the command that's given if you want this reward. What does it say? Feed the flock of God. Feed the flock of God. Which is among you. Which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof. Yes. Not by constraint. Yes. But willingly. Right. Not for filthy loaf. Not for, no, we're not for money. But of a ready mind. But of a ready mind. Go ahead. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. Yes. But being examples to the flock. Yes. And when the chief shepherd shall. Now listen to this very well, people. And when the chief shepherd. And who is the chief shepherd, y'all? Talk to me. In Christianity, who's the chief shepherd? Yeah. Jesus. Right? 
And when the chief shepherd what? Shall appear. Shall appear. You shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Everybody say the crown of glory. This is the reward that you get for teaching others the truth or teaching others the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now notice again, is again, is that psychology. You don't know when he's coming back. That's what the psychology is all about. So you, this is what you need to be doing. And when he comes back, when he appears, this is the reward you'll get. But now that you know he ain't coming back, What's your motivation? Y'all getting this? See, these are the reasons why churches are packed. Because people got to do stuff, man. You got to sacrifice. You got to get some service. Service. If you want a reward when the Lord comes. Yeah. But now you know he ain't coming. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Let's look at the next one. Oh, this is going to be real good here. 1 Corinthians 9.25. Now, actually, verse 9, verse 24 through 27, actually. 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 24 through 27. What does it say? Let no man seek his own. No. No, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. It should say, Know ye not. Know ye not that they which run in a race now before, run before, all. Before you get any further, have you, how many of y'all ever heard this before? The race is not given to the. Swift. All right, all right. Neither is it given to the. Strong. But to him that does what? Ah, see, all of us were taught this. Okay, so we're talking about running a race now. Right? Did y'all not know the Olympics ain't nothing new? Yep. Olympics go on in church, churches every week. <laughs> Folk are trying to outdo the other one. And you about to read why, right here and right now. Go on, read. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? Yes. But one received the prize. Are y'all getting this? So run that you may obtain. Wow. Now we're talking about, now here running a race means running for the Lord. That's what running this race is. Running for the Lord. Running, running, running. I can't tear it. Oh, you know, you've heard that before now. <laughs> running up the king's highway. Oh, running, running, running. Oh, I can't tear it. Running, running, running. Ooh, we had some running folk in the church when I was growing up. With that old song, he said, I've been running for Jesus for a long time. I'm not tired yet. I've been running for Jesus for a long time. Oh, I'm not tired yet. I see y'all know these songs. Y'all see the psychology? Well, here's where it comes from. Songs like that came out of this verse right here. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize? Black folk want to be the one to get that prize. Now check out how deep this goes. What is this prize for? Go ahead. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Yes. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Now they're doing all this. The crown that they're going to receive ain't going to last forever. But we're doing it so we can receive a crown that will not corrupt. Incorruptible. An incorruptible crown. Go ahead. I therefore so run. Now check this out, brothers and sisters. I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly. Not as uncertainly. In other words, I ain't running. You don't know what I'm running for. Go ahead. So fight I. So fight I. Not as one that beateth the air. Not like I'm just wasting my time. Go ahead. But I keep under my body. Now here it is. This is what this crown is for. But I keep under my body. In other words, I discipline myself. Go ahead. And bring it unto subjection. I bring my body under subjection. Lest that by any means. Lest that after, go ahead. 
That, it means when I have preached to others, after I've te taught others, I myself should be a castaway. I should myself should be a castaway or disqualified. So what he's actually saying here is this record, this record, this reward is called the incorruptible crown. And guess what you get it for? For how you take care of your body. Y'all getting this? Now, weren't we taught, I'm going to call, call the first one, what's the most important sin in the church? Come on, say it, don't be scared. Fornication, yes. That, like, lying ain't the most important one. Or fornication, that's the main one you hear. Fornication, 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 fornication. So this one says, I keep my body and bring it under subjection. That's right, that's right. So in other words, can I keep it real? The less you get, the better your chances of a great reward. Because you're keeping your body under subjection. You look across the church, you see somebody look good to you. You say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Keep my body under subjection. <laughs> Y'all see how this works? You tell yourself. Mm -mm. And then, of course, there's other things that they don't talk about in church. They need to, like eating too much. We don't talk about that as a sin. God knows they don't. Look at look around some of our churches. Man, shoot. Why ain't that? Why they don't talk? They don't talk about bringing your body into subjection for that. Mm-mm. Folks sitting up in church with a with a fried chicken leg in their pocket, <laughs> reach down and get a nibble right in the middle of the message. <laughs> yeah, y'all pray the Lord. Mm. <laughs> So because of the sacrifice you make for your body, this is the crown you get. One more crown. Yeah. And there are two verses I want you to read, Minister Stewart, for this crown. The first is James 1 and 12, and the second is Revelation 2 and 10. What does is, what is James 1 and 12 say? Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy. That's what blessed means, y'all. Happy is the person who endures temptation. Child, y'all just don't know. I'm going to be strong. <laughs> I'm going to be strong. <laughs> I'm endure this temptation. You don't know what I'm going through. Mm, mm, mm. I got to endure this temptation. I'm going to tell you why I got to endure this temptation. Read, what does it say? For when he is tried, because when I'm tried, he shall receive the crown of life. I'll give a crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. Wow. As for enduring temptation, get a crown of life. So when you're tempted, you resist that thing. Why? So you can get a crown of life. But we took all that away from you. So, how do you handle temptation now? If you can't be with the one you love, love the one you with, love the one you with, it's your thing. Do what you want to do, so uh-huh. Yeah, see, see, see. 
Let's do it again. Do it in the morning. Sweet dreams in summertime. Give your feet. I don't even know the words. All laid up next to mine. How about Revelation 2 and 12? Let's see what it says about the crown of life. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos. That's Revelation 2 and 12. I'm sorry, 2 and 10. I'm sorry. 2 and 10. Okay. Verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Now check this out. Check this out. You are going to suffer for the Lord. In fact, we've been taught that if I'm a reign with him, I got to suffer with him. Go ahead. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Whoa! Now mind you, the person who's supposed to be saying this didn't even exist. But church folk don't know that. Child, the Bible says some of us may even get put in prison. Go ahead. That you may be tried. So that you'll be tested. Go ahead. And you shall have tribulation ten days. They're going, you going, man, you're going to go through all kind of hell for ten days or more. Go ahead. Be thou faithful unto death. But, if you be faithful unto death, what will happen? And I will give thee a crown of life. God going to give you a crown of life. That's where they come up with songs like you just said. I'm about to say it to you. I made it. Said I wasn't going to make it, but I made it. Oh, yes, I did. And I know I'm going to receive. But see, we took all that away from you. And consciousness. Because consciousness does not give you a crown. Are y'all getting this? So brothers and sisters, there's a marketing strategy. Get 2 Corinthians 5 for me because this is very important. There's a marketing strategy that says in religion that it's very important how you live your life. That's the marketing strategy for religion. It's important how you live your life because how you live your life will determine what kind of reward you're going to get. And of course, here's the verse we all grew up on. Go ahead, 2 Corinthians 5. First verse? Yes. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Y'all remember this? Mm -hmm. We know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we it's have, all right. Why is it all right? We have a building of God. Because I got another building. A house not made with hands. A house not made with hands. Y'all remember these? Uh huh. And where is it? Eternal in the heavens. Eternal heaven. in the heavens. Go ahead. For in this we groan. Yeah. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house. I, to I told heaven. you. I told you. This time I'm poor folk who ain't got no clothes. <laughs> if so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Go ahead. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Yes. Being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality, mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now these are all verses that are taught to us in Christendom. Now, notice the sixth verse. What does it say? Therefore, we are always confident. Yes. Knowing that while, while we, we are at, at home, home in the body, in the body we, are absent. we are absent from the Lord. Y'all getting this? So it puts this psychology in the minds of Christians to, you know, don't even want to be in this life. They don't want to even exist here because I'm, a, I'm just a stranger passing through. This world is not my home. All that kind of sick stuff in the head. Okay? So what does it go on to say? For we walk by faith. And well, don't, don't, even, don't even read the rest. Let everybody else finish it. What does the rest say, y'all? Ain't that neat, see? <laughs> see? She just said it and y'all knew how to complete it. We walk by faith and not by sight. One of the dumbest statements in the world. 
You walk by what you can't see instead of walking by what you can see. Only a fool does that. Only a fool does that. Walk by faith. Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Look at somebody next to you and say, go pay your bill with faith. Go pay your bill with faith. Go down the avenue with faith. Because the Bible says it is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen, which means it is real. So go on and pay your bill with it. Pull up to your gas station. Pull up to the gas pump while you're on E. And use faith to pump your gas. I dare you to. We are confident, I say, and willing rather, eighth verse says to be absent from the body and be present of the Lord. Therefore, now notice what does the ninth verse say, Minister Stewart? Wherefore we labor. Well, but therefore we do what? Labor. One more time. We do what? Labor. We labor? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to labor, people? Work. Work. Not just work, work hard. Toil. We don't labor mm -hmm. in consciousness. We've been set free. We don't have to do it. We come, we sit, we listen, we learn, and we go home. But we don't labor. <laughs> no, we don't do that. Why do we labor? Go ahead. That whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Wow, we may be accepted of him. In other words, if I don't do what I am required to do, when he comes back, he ain't going to accept me. Y'all see the psychology here? Y'all getting it? So what is it going to say? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Go ahead. That everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now hold up here. So you mean to tell me that we were taught in the church growing up, at least I was, that one day I'm going to have to stand before what kind of seat? The judgment seat of Christ to be judged of the things I've done in my life whether it was good or bad. You mean tell me that's what we were taught? That's what we were taught. Look at somebody near you and say, consciousness doesn't teach that. And look back at him and say, that is not true. Look back at him and say, actually, this came from African consciousness. Now look back at him and say, it's just that we forgot it. And it goes on to say in the 11th verse, check, check, check this out now, notice the 11th verse. Uh, one, two, three, four. What's the fourth word of the 11th verse, Minister Stewart? Terror. What is it? Terror. Terror. Now read that 11th verse. Notice what it says. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Stop. Everybody say fear factor. Very important part of this to make people give a life of service and sacrifice. Because if you don't give service and sacrifice of your time, of your money, of your resources, of your energy, if you don't sacrifice, then you have to deal with the terror of the Lord. And you don't want to do that. I don't want to stand and have to have God, the terror of God upon me. No! So that means that if the pastor says, I want you here on Thursday night, you may have a family function. And I see too many sisters saying to their family, 
I, honey, let's hurry and get this done. I got to get to church. The church becomes more important than your family because of this psychology. You don't want to miss out with God. And then preachers actually look at you when you don't show up at church and say, don't do God like that. Are y'all getting this? Don't do God like that because you didn't come to church. When really what they're saying is, don't do the church like that because you know you ain't going to give the money that you would have gave if you were here. But they don't say it like that. They tell you don't do God that way. So here's where it is, man. Every Christian is taught that if they faithfully serve their Lord Jesus Christ, when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ, It'll be a time of great rejoicing because they will receive rewards that will last throughout eternity. Unfortunately, when it comes to African spirituality and doing my art, we don't have a list of crowns for you. When it comes to African spirituality and doing my art, we don't have different rewards that you get after you die. Even though the entire idea of the judgment seat of Christ comes from ancient Egypt. And those of you who are watching this right now on your screen, you see the judgment scene is taken from ancient Egypt. In the great hall of Ma'adi, where the deceased person appears before the judgment seat of Asar, or the judgment seat of Osiris, thousands of years before some so-called Jesus Christ even came into the minds of people. This whole concept of judgment and rewards came from our ancestors. But we don't know that. We think it came from the church. And because we think it came from the church and you found out that the church is not really the right program for you, you've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And said, well, I don't really need to do anything then. Not so, brothers and sisters, according to our story. When the deceased person stands at the judgment seat of Asar, having passed the test of the deeds done in his life, he comes to the scales of my eye. Yes, yes. And there's a dude standing there mm -hmm. named Jehudi. The Greeks call him Thoth. And he's standing with a pad and a pen yeah, yeah. because he is the record keeper of all of the things done in your life. Good and bad, just like we just read. But y'all think it came from Christianity. No, it came from Africa. And Thoth of Jehudi standing there with a record of your life, holding the book of life in his hand, looking at the record of events in your life, deeds in your life. And then in this African judgment scene, your heart is placed on the scale. Yes. On one side, in the feather of truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, reciprocity is on the other side of the scale. Yes. Are y'all seeing this in your head? Yes. And if your heart is heavier than the feather of truth, there's this beast yes. sitting there waiting for you. His name is Amut, A-M-M-U-T. And he's actually called the Devourer. Uh -huh. talk, talk, talk. He's also called, oh my goodness, oh. <laughs> he's also called, the, in case y'all don't know this, Amut is also called the second death. The first death was the physical death, but Amut is sitting there waiting for you if your life wasn't up to par, if you spent your time wasting time, if you spent your time engaged in foolish activity, dumb conversations, useless chatter. He's sitting there waiting for you. Waiting to devour you. 
got the head of a crocodile, the mid parts of a lion, and the bottom part of a hippopotamus. The three greatest man eaters in ancient Egypt. Yeah, buddy. So in our ancient African spiritual systems, we didn't have crowns. But escaping Amut was good enough. Y'all getting this? And in the in the in our judgment scene of our African spirituality, if the feather of my eye outweighs your heart then you get to pass by the devourer and go to stand at the judgment seat of a sar, where a sar would look at you and say, well done. Enter into the kingdom of your ancestors. Y'all don't have to take my word for what I'm saying. You see, the problem is after the invaders came and conquered our people, they substituted their lies for our truth. Are y'all getting this? And generations later, after being born and raised into these lies, we developed an obligation to these lies. As though they are the truth. Minister Stewart, if you will, anybody who got there, who see him? Turn to page 105, 106. Show you that, show you, here's your evidence right here of standing in the hall of righteousness. Notice what, the, notice what our scriptures say thousands of years before a so called biblical text even existed. Yes. So you need to understand where they stole all this from. So you'll stop throwing it away. These principles of reward and punishment came from our ancestors. And yes, you do have a bad day coming if your life ain't right. Yes, sir. All right. You do have a bad day coming for how you spent your time. Yes, yes you do. Yes. Yes. Don't think that just because the Roman Catholic Church created a lie that the penalty for your behavior don't exist. Yes, the Hosea, page 105, 106, section 2, what does it say? May I not be judged according to the mouth of the multitude. Now here's what our ancestral scriptures say millennia ago. When I die, may I not be judged according to the mouth of the multitude. Go ahead. May my soul lift itself up before my heart. Wow. And be found to have been righteous on earth. May my soul lift itself up before my heart and be found to be what? Righteous. Say it y'all, what? Righteous. Righteous. Mm -hmm. Take self, I want y'all to take just 10 seconds and take self inventory and ask yourself, have I been righteous? Have I been dealing righteously? Have I been thinking righteously? Have I been doing righteously? Ask yourself. Because that's the questions that's going to happen when you stand in the judgment hall of Mahati. Yes. May my heart lift itself up before my soul and be found to have been righteous while I was on earth. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. May I come into your presence, O Lord of Lords. May I come into your presence, O Lord of Lords. Yes. May I reach the hall of righteousness. May I reach the hall of righteousness. May I rise like a living God. Wow. Like I said, y'all, we ain't got no crowns to give you. But we do have a state of existence to give you. Yes. May I rise like a living God. And give forth light. And give forth light. Like the divine powers that are in heaven. Like the divine powers that are where? In heaven. In heaven. Told y'all, 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 this whole concept of heaven didn't come from the white man. Black folk who think they got so daggone deep. You tell me, ah, right, man, don't, don't, don't bring me that stuff about heaven and hell. You better listen to it. 
Because the whole concept came from our ancestors millennia ago. They understood that there was a, a, a day of reckoning coming for how you spent your life on earth. Am I making sense, people? Yes, yes. What does the next paragraph say, Minister Stewart? Let me proceed in peace to the West. Let me proceed in peace to the West. Y'all know what the West represents? The West represents sunset. Or after you've closed your eyes and taken your last breath. Go ahead. May the lords of the sacred land receive me and give me threefold praise. May the lords of the sacred lands receive me and give me threefold praise in peace. Go ahead. May they make a seat for me beside the elders of the council. Oh, y'all hear this? One of the first songs that I learned as a musician in the church was this song. Plenty good room, plenty good room. Plenty good room in my father's kingdom. Plenty good room, plenty good room. Choose your seat and sit down. And it's deep because when I, was, when, I, when I learned that song, even as a teenager, there was something about the message in it that connected to my spirit. And now I'm seeing it here in our scriptures. May, the, may they make a seat for me among the elders of the council. Read. May I ascend in the presence of the beneficent. See, see, this is what happens if you have lived a life worthy. When you stand at the judgment hall of Ma'ati. What's that last part you were just reading? May I ascend in the presence of the beneficent. May I ascend in the presence of the beneficent one. Go ahead. And may I assume whatever form I want in whatever place my spirit wishes to be. That's heavy, y'all. That's heavy. May I assume whatever form I want to assume in whatever place my spirit wishes to be. That's heaven. You see, brothers and sisters, the lies that were given to us of a fictitious savior means we won't be saved. After all, how can something that's not real save you? A fiction cannot save you. I don't care how much you believe in it. A fiction can't save you. But our spirituality the truth of our spirituality, guess what y'all, it doesn't make you look for a savior. The truth of our spirituality, it makes you your own savior. The truth of our spirituality tells you that you must rescue, you must save yourself. When I say save, I mean that you must redeem yourself. You must rescue yourself. You must strengthen yourself. You must empower yourself. You must heal yourself. You must educate yourself. You must deliver yourself. That's what our spirituality teaches. And since you are, look at somebody and say, since you are not a fictitious entity. Now prove it. Reach out and touch it. Say, no, you ain't fictitious. Say, since you are not fictitious, look at him and tell him, your salvation is in your hands. Tell him again, since you are not fictitious, your salvation is in your hand. Don't believe that. Tell them, don't believe that. Know that. Do 